Well, good morning, everybody. Um, basically, welcome to the investment markets and superannuation updates um, through the coronavirus. Uh, the, the intention of this is really just to provide everybody with a little bit of um, an understanding of where we're at as far as uh, particularly investment markets are, are concerned. Um, I am happy to take questions throughout, but um, I've been told that uh, a similar session to this, which was run in Queensland um, earlier on, um, or actually early last week, um, had an extraordinary number of questions. So we'll just basically see how we go. Anything that um, you know can't be dealt with, we'll deal with later on. Um, so my name's Mark Wilkinson. I'm the superannuation partner at the um, Sydney office. I also uh, provide consulting advice with regard to individuals' wealth and retirement planning, etc. So uh, well placed to actually uh, provide any um, or deal with any of the issues that are sort of coming out of this this virus at the moment. Um, before we actually launch into the um, presentation, a couple of uh, things that I just wanted to mention. We've already talked about questions and how we'll deal with those. Um, the presentation slides are loaded into the webinar as a handout, so you can basically open that up and print that out on your own computers. Um, if you've got any technical difficulties during the session, don't um, email me through the chat box, rather go straight to support at goto.com slash webinar and um, and the people there will be able to uh, reconnect you if you've got problems or, or deal with any issues as far as um, audio, etc. is concerned. Um, what we're going to do post-session is that we'll uh, follow up with an email that'll have the uh, slides in it, they'll have a link to the recording, um, so the, it is, the session is being recorded today. Um, and we'll also provide you with access to past and future webinars because we have a uh, effectively a TV channel type thing that um, you know, provides you with all that information as well as our contact details. Um, look, this is not the um, last of the webinars that I'm intending to run throughout COVID-19. There will be uh, an upcoming session dealing with um, superannuation planning um, in falling investment markets and covering some of the issues that you should be aware of there. But that's that will be for a, in about a week or two. Um, I'm sure that uh, this, you know, our current circumstances will keep us where we are for at least that long. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, we've got health and the economic uh, impact. So look, really, obviously, we've had some fairly significant falls in, in particularly share markets. Um, other markets um, have probably been a little bit more sheltered. Um, there is, we've obviously had lots of questions with regard to commercial and residential property, and I've got some comments to make with regard to that um, a little bit down, down the track. Um, a question that we commonly have uh, been asked um, is when do we think that markets might start to improve? And the reality is that you're not going to get any substantial uptick um, in values until two things happen. One, there is a, a, a clear resolution um, with regard to the health crisis that we've currently got. Um, that That is um, you know, the, the core to everything. Um, and then of course, um, once that starts to occur, um, we will then basically then ensure, actually my slides are disappearing here, I'm not quite sure what's going on. Um, just bear with me for one moment. Um, so first of all, we have to deal with a health issue. Um, and then the second will be um, the degree that we have a relaxation in the um, social distancing rules, um, because until that occurs, the the markets themselves uh, will not get back to normal. Um, and, and having had regard to both those particular aspects, it's probably fair to say uh, that as far as Australia is concerned, we're dealing with the health issue, it seems to me, uh, to be fairly effectively. I noticed this morning that uh, New South Wales had 52 uh, new coronavirus infections. Uh, that is well down on the peak that we had a number of, um, um, uh, well, you know, towards the beginning of last week, um, and is a fairly strong indicator that the curve is flattening in, in this particular location. But even here, 
Um, they are saying that without a, uh, a vaccine, it is highly unlikely that the social distancing rules will be overly relaxed in the immediate term, but probably of more impact um, as far as um, the overall economy is concerned is that you look overseas and uh, and, and basically uh, Europe is far from out of the woods um, because they do not have a consistent um, approach to the uh, infection right across that continent. Um, America, you know, recent articles that I've read with regard to, the, to, to their circumstances uh, indicate that they are very much in for the worst of um, uh, you know the impacts of of the virus on their economy, uh, not yet, but in in weeks to come. Um, you know, with pro prospects of 10,000 deaths per day, so they are many weeks away from um, any form of relaxation as far as rules um, are, are concerned. Um, just a little bit of a quick look at the uh, the curve. Um, Obviously, what we will find uh, uh, th running through the economy is, um, as 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 it appears that we are starting to get some form of control over, over the infection itself, there will be some slight um, relaxation um, of um, conditions and movement of people um, within economies and within locations. And, and with that in mind, it's actually worthwhile just having a look here at Singapore. Now, this was taken uh, this this graph was from, from a little while ago, but you can see that um, obviously Singapore at that stage was well below uh, the trend lines of other locations. Um, it is interesting that um, ha having relaxed some of their social distancing uh, provisions in, in the last couple of weeks, they are now getting a second um, a second wave of infections coming through, which they will then will now have to turn their attention on how to deal with it, whether they go back to the original circumstance original conditions on movement um, or the, whether they come you know back to something that's a little bit more relaxed um, we'll wait and see but you know that that embodies the dilemma that governments are actually facing um, you know as, as infection rates come down how much movement how much freedom in the economy do we allow uh, without actually allowing the infection rates to go up to a level that can't be dealt with effectively um, in that particular location. So that, 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 that is the issue that we need to consider. Um, so that's dealing with the health aspects of this. As far as the, um, uh, the, the Australian government's response to the economic uh, impact of having to potentially shut down the eco economy, um, it is interesting to look back at uh, what's actually been achieved so far and how quickly that movement has actually taken place. So basically we've had tw three sets of uh, government uh, stimulus, starting out with a $17.6 um, billion dollar package, which was largely directed at employers, um, followed up by an additional $66 um, billion on the 22nd of March, um, which is once again largely directed at um, businesses and uh, keeping particular workers in jobs. And then, of course, we had the job keeper. Um, so the $66 billion was designed or, or directed at uh, increasing the uh, new start allowance and providing the bonus uh, to people who had actually lost their jobs and were under certain um, entitlements. Um, and then, of course, on the 30th of March, we had the uh, announcement of the JobKeeper legislation. So that legislation um, is due to be debated in Parliament tomorrow uh, and provides a flat, um, a flat $1,500 per fortnight uh, to employees that have, um, you know, been made redundant, had their hours reduced by 30%, um, uh, etc. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit involved in that particular. Uh, particular measure. Um, whether that will be sufficient, whether that will be the end of it, we'll have to basically wait and see. If you look to see um, the size of um, other global economies in the top 20, um, we sit at the level of about 1.95, so in here uh, just below Italy, um, although it's probably uh, reasonable to say that Italy's um, economy is, is performing at nowhere near uh, $1.99 trillion at the moment, it'd be well below that. Um, um, and $320 million or billion dollars um, over that uh, 1.9 is around about 16% of, um, of GDP um, on, on uh, over the Ford estimates. It's, it's interesting also that um, the United States and the way different countries are approaching this, the United States with its $3 trillion 
um, in stimulus, um, want, you know, much more directed at businesses as opposed to uh, those that were going to become unemployed. Um, that also is a stimulus package of around about 16%. So people are, you know, government, governments and countries are obviously um, keeping their powder dry uh, with regard to uh, the types of issues that, um, you know, and the tools that they may well be able to bring to the, to bear uh, at, at points in the future should should that be needed. And it is reasonable to say that at this stage that, um, you know, that, that there will be an, a need to bring that information and those stimuluses forward at, at that stage because this will continue um, for quite some time. So, you know, what are we seeing and what are we hearing? Well, basically, you know, it's an unprecedented situation. There's fast, it's fast moving. Um, I mean, it doesn't get any more shocking than to find that uh, Boris Johnson is, um, is is in intensive care at the moment. Um, and we're relying upon um, keeping our information and getting our information from trusted sources um, as much as possible. Which brings us to the way that, um, you know, of course, we've all uh, intending to, um, you know, approach the markets given, you know, the degree of uncertainty that we're currently uh, feeling. Um, and that is, you know, th through a disciplined approach. Um, obviously, you know, we, we, we've got to be important or got to be careful um, that, um, sorry, th 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 we've got to be careful uh, that we don't uh, react in an emotional way as far as our investments or, or the decisions that we're actually taking. Um, diversification um, obviously is extraordinarily important at the moment. Um, you know, a spread of investments and continuing to hold those investments across a broad range of asset categories uh, will provide people with, um, you know, much greater protection to the fluctuations um, that are likely to occur within share markets, um, uh, particularly um, in, 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 you know, the near future. And uh, relying upon uh, regular updates from trusted um, sources, uh, economic commentators and so on. Um, so this slide here just sort of provides you with a bit of a, a summary of where we've come from. Um, you know, so from basically mid-February, um, where there hadn't been much reaction to the virus until that stage, you know, there was a belief that governments had things under control. We then had a 37.1% fall in the ASX. So we've reached a point where probably it's it's reasonable to assume that most people will regard many of the stocks and securities on issue uh, through that exchange as being on the cheapest side. Does that mean we've actually um, hit a recovery point? Um, Look, my our view would probably be that uh, we are not there yet. As as I said in the beginning, what we're really looking for um, is some firm information with regard to the development of a vaccine, or a, or an extraordinary song, strong indication that the social distancing provisions that uh, we are using is managing to control the number of um, uh, new infections within our in, uh, economy or economic zone. Um, but we also need to see that same information applied across the world. I mean, the old expression that uh, America catches, uh, you know, um, catches a cold, um, it affects markets in, in all places is no more true than it will be at the moment. And uh, for that ma for that reason, we've really got to look to see, well, what's happening as far as infections, et cetera, uh, uh, what is taking place in America at the moment to, to get some form of handle as to whether we're going to get any certainty going forward. Um, so the numbers of infections and the rate at which obviously governments will start to allow or loosen uh, the controls that are currently in place that are inhibiting um, economic activity uh, through the social distancing rules and so on. So while they remain in place, you will find that uh, the, the, the markets won't fully recover. Uh, they will bounce up and down. So while cheap, there is no actual need for, for people to rush out and consider buying um, into shares and, uh, and other investments at the moment. Um, if you really want to do that, um, then possibly an approach that you might look to uh, adopt is sort of a dollar cost averaging approach whereby you make small investments over say the next 12 months. Um, and yes, you won't buy everything at the bottom of the market, um, but what you will do is you will smooth out any fluctuations that might arise 
um, um, or, or certainly will arise um, in the foreseeable future. Um, for those of you that are already invested and you've ridden the markets down to this particular point, all I can say to you is that now is not the time to get out. Um, and if we have a look at this uh, little slide here, this is really, you know, when markets are volatile and performance is weak, investors who hold their nerve may recover their losses more quickly than those who sell out. So, um, and then try to re-enter it at a, at a later time. So fundamentally, what we're talking about here is people who are, who are invested in good businesses, um, be, be they be a BHB or CSL or Woolworths or Bunnings or whatever it happens to be, and they haven't sold, um, until this particular point in time. Um, so it's, but it is worthwhile going through and having just a little bit of a look at um, where people's um, mental state is um, at, at, different, at different points of time, if you look at this particular chart. So here, um, here we are back in uh, 2007 before the, uh, the GFC. Um, and so at that stage, I'm so happy I invested when I did. In fact, you might even take that a bit further and say, well, geez, aren't I a great investor? I always make the right decisions. But you can see at that point that we then actually go on a uh, continual downward spiral. Um, the market falls a little bit. We think, oh, well, there's got to be a recovery soon. Um, assets are cheap. Um, now's the time to get in. Um, you know, it, it can't keep going like this. But of course, potentially it, it can. Um, and if, at that point, you're starting to think, well, I can't take this anymore, I'm out. Um, so basically the person gets out at that particular stage. Um, I'm not gonna incur any more losses. I'm, I'm just going to hold my money in cash and fixed interest where it's nice and safe and I can actually sleep at night. But of course, what happens as a result of that um, is that the individual misses the first part of the recovery. And the part that they miss is basically from here all the way through to there, okay? Uh, which is why we've actually got this blue line. So this is the point at which we start to believe that in fact, okay, well, we're confident that a recovery is on the way. Uh, maybe we're going to start to make money for our investments if we continue to hold them. Um, in the indefinite period. So we get in at that stage, but of course we actually get in um, at this point and, and, and we get in at that point because in fact, we've been out of the market for that period there. So therefore we've actually had no recovery. So we're starting from a much lower base. And while we actually mirror the market on the way up here, we've not actually got back to an era, an era where we're anywhere near uh, breaking even. Whereas actually up here, um, in 2010-11, um, we'd actually, if we'd been stayed invested in the share market the entire period, we actually would have recovered virtually all of the losses that we had made um, and got back to a position where they were so happy that I invested when I did and stayed invested in that particular in that particular market. So that's the that's the issue that you've got to bear bear in mind. If the businesses that you're invested in, and that's the way you need to think about these equities, if the businesses that you're invested in are good businesses and they are still good businesses, um, then I would you know certainly our position would be don't get out now is not the time to sell. It's not necessarily the time to reinvest, but it's certainly not the time to sell. Hold your, hold your nerve um, and because the recovery will come and it will come sooner rather than later. Um, even the most pessimistic, well, I shouldn't say that, I guess, but um, you know, the, the, there seems to be a general consensus that we will have a vaccine within 18 months. So certainly within 18 months, they will start with the health issue uh, potentially will be dealt with. Um, and then the, we can start to turn our t attention to the economic issues that might have arisen from this health issue, um, but things will have turned uh, at that particular point in time. So that's that's what we need to bear in mind. Okay, um, so that's that's the economic uh, component um, of, of the presentation. Just to turn my attention to the um, some of the uh, the the SIS and uh, or superannuation measures and concessions that uh, we've actually been given um, with regard to the, um, uh, you know, 
the, 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 well, I'll start again. Turning our attention to some of the superannuation concessions we've been given at the same time as the economic stimulus has actually been going into trying to keep the economy afloat. And there are certain uh, benefits to the types of issues that we need to be um, aware of. The first is that um, our minimum pensions um, have been reduced and they've been reduced for the 1920 and the 2021 uh, financial year. So if we move forward to that. Um, so the question is then, okay, if I've got a pension that's been reduced and the legislation that enabled that took place on the 24th of March, 2020, as a pensioner, I basically need to consider when when did I actually have, to, when did I actually pay my pensions for the current year? So if I had a million dollars inside a pension fund and my drawdown rate was 5% or $50,000 and I paid, um, I paid myself $30,000 before the 24th of March, which is when the legislation was uh, implemented to reduce the minimum pension payment by 50%. So if, that, if that's the date on which it occurred and my payment of 30,000 occurred prior to that date, then I, then I need to pay no more, uh, no more uh, pension for the year ended 2020. Um, of course, I've paid more than uh, I needed to. So if my intention was always to pay just a minimum pension to myself each year, and I've now been told that my original minimum pension has been reduced by 50%, um, Thirty percent, thirty thousand dollars exceeds twenty-five by five. Can I take that five thousand dollars and put that back into a superannuation fund? And the answer is yes, you can, but only if you are eligible to make a contribution. Um, it's not an amount that you can treat as an error um, and then just return to the fund without it being treated as a contribution. So uh, many of our clients that um, are in pension mode, of course, are over the age of sixty-five. If you're over the age of 65 and you are uh, and you want to make a contribution up to age say 74, uh, you need to need to have worked at least a uh, 40 hours in a 30-day period, or basically 10 hours a week um, for for four weeks. Um, if you wanted to make that contribution, if you don't meet what they refer to as the work test. Um, uh, before you make that contribution, you're not eligible to make the contribution. So in answer to the question, can I put that $5,000 in, depends on how old you are, Was it whether, whether I am below, over or uh, below the age of 65, or if I'm over 65, have I met the work test? Uh, without meeting those tests, um, of course, you know, you, 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 you potentially uh, are not going to uh, be able to return the money uh, to the fund. Now this, when the last time we had a reduction in minimum pension payments was during the GFC. Um, as it turned out at that particular time, the reduction um, or the, the reduction in the minimum didn't actually occur, uh, didn't actually change until the markets had pretty well fully recovered. So there was a, having reduced them by 50%, they then um, uh, basically gradually stepped up the required minimum until it hit the full amount. So we may well find that this reduction in minimum payments uh, lasts for a lot longer uh, than the 30th of June 2021, um, but we'll have to have to bear that in mind. Um, for those of you that are in transition to retirement, so pensions. So these are pensions that you know enable people who are not yet 65 and who have not yet um, retired to commence a pension and draw a maximum um, of 10% from a fund each year as a pension payment. Um, if you're under the age of 60, the pensions are accessible income. If you're over 60, they're to exempt. Um, there has been no change in the maximum pension um, and withdrawal amount. So that no change reference there is referring just to um, a transition to retirement pensions. It doesn't have any impact as far as your um, other, other pensions. Now, some of you might also have questions as to, and you know, we've got the rates of reduction there, which are fairly straightforward. But uh, the other thing that you need to know 
um, is for your particular clients. What type of pension have you been receiving? So certain people, not very many, will have an allocated pension. This is a pension that was established prior to 2007 and the terms of it have not changed. It's calculated um, in accordance with the schedules contained in the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act um, and they have both a minimum and maximum amount. Um, the reduction in the minimum drawdown for an allocated pension is 50%. The reduction in the minimum pensions required with regard to market link pensions, which are a complying pension that certain individuals might have commenced prior to 2007, is also 50%. Um, and the reduction in the account-based pension, which is the most common pension, or anyone who's commenced a pension since 2007, they will be in receipt of an account-based pension. That is also a 50% reduction. Now, some of you might also have flexible pensions, which is calculated according to a formula, a complying lifetime pension, or a complying life expectancy pension. To have one of these pensions, they needed to commence prior to 2006. They've not been legally been able to be paid from a self-managed super fund in the period since. They are not affected. So those pensions, because the, the formula and the minimum uh, that is paid under these defined benefit pensions is based on the total fund asset base or member asset balance and the period for which it's contractually required to be paid. So it's there is no reduction uh, with regard to those and they are guaranteed pensions um, being defined benefit, um, which means that they're not subject to investment fluctuations and therefore there is no need uh, potentially uh, to apply a reduction in the income stream um, at times like these, because the risk rests with the fund trustee uh, and not with the fund member. So hopefully that's clear. So just to reiterate, allocated pensions, allocated pensions, account-based pensions, and market-linked pensions, the reduction by 50 cent, 50 percent applies to them. Uh, for your complying pensions, uh, being your complying lifetime and life expectancy, there is no reduction. Um, the reductions, by the way, are actually outlined here. Um, I won't go through, or I'll, I'll only briefly go through the calculations uh, just to show you how potentially they apply, uh, but it is not overly complicated. Okay, so there's just a, a summary of the, um, the, the fund, fund pensions that are affected and not affected in this way. So if we've got an account-based pension um, and the minimum under the old rules says that um, Sam has got to draw a pension of you know nearly twenty thousand. So, you know, if he was um, if he was um, um, you know under the age of sixty five but retired and therefore he's originally drawing a pension at the rate of four percent, we know that um, we've got a figure there that you know means that he's got an overall account balance of. Um, I'm just doing a quick calculation of about 475,000. Okay, so that's a you know a four percent reduction um, um, on that. So the, the as of the 24th of March, we know that the 50% reduction applies. He was drawing 19,110. Uh, 50% of that is 9,555. The calculation means that um, you round up where the figure falls on the five, you round up to the nearest 10. If it falls on the underside, so uh, it had been 9,554, you would have rounded down to the nearest whole whole, you know, whole decimal, um, 10 tens. So the minimum payment here is 9,560. Just be careful. Uh, I know with our BDO clients that we're currently dealing with, we are in the process of sending them um, communication outlining what the redu reduced pensions are. Uh, the key component is that you still need to make sure that you make your minimum pension payment. Um, so if you paid nothing before the 24th of March, which is the date on which the reduction occurred, then Sam in this case would need to pay 9560 before the uh, the 30th of June, if he fails to do so, then potentially the pension will be treated as if it ceased on the 1st of July 
2019, which of course means that the fund's income is fully accessible. While you can go to the ATO and request at their discretion to treat the, uh, the, the to, to enable the pension to be treated as if it continued, you cannot guarantee that uh, that will be accepted, and uh, and therefore you just need to be careful with that. Um, so or just make sure you make your pension minimum pension payments. That's that's the issue there. Now, okay. Um, so a couple of quick questions. Um, some of these were probably dealt with, but I'll just go quickly go through them again. So Sam has already paid 19,010. No, he doesn't need to pay any more before the 30th of June 2020. Okay, if Sam, Sam, if Sam's up to the 24th of March, had only paid 8,000, he only has a further uh, 1,560 to pay, taking him up to 9,560. If Sam had paid 50,000, he doesn't he doesn't have to pay any more, but he cannot return the excess, um, except if he makes a contribution. And to make a contribution, he has to be eligible to make a contribution. That's the uh, that's the issue that um, arises uh, with regard to that. Um, if he's not eligible to make the contribution, the money cannot be returned to the fund. Um, so you. Put, yeah, so there are there are other issues that possibly are, are worthwhile looking at, um, but you know, but they would require specific advice. So if you're concerned about this, uh, please make inquiries of your advisors. Um, we'll provide clients, um, you know, obviously with all of the uh, calculations and the supporting materials that they need um, with regard to, um, you know, with adjusting their income streams. Um, in the short term, um, the probably the one final point I'll make with regard to that minimum, um, given that we do know that uh, each year we're going to have to make the minimum pension withdrawals, and given that we know that there's going to be a high degree of volatility in investment markets, probably for the you know the next 12 to 18 months, um, it, it it potentially would uh, may be prudent to actually hold the amounts that you're intending to utilise to make pension payments in the foreseeable future in cash or low, uh, uh, you know, conservative investments that are less likely to, uh, you know, fluctuate um, in line with markets, um, just to enable, to ensure that, in fact, you're not forced into a situation where you have to sell assets uh, and other property in order to make pension payments. Because, of course, we know that if you're making a pension payment, that payment um, needs to be made in cash. It cannot be made a, a, in the form of an, an in-specie distribution of an asset. So um, cash needs to be paid. If the assets fall in value, you may have less cash to pay those pension payments than you might otherwise have, uh, might otherwise have been the case. Okay, so uh, direct property. Uh, there's a couple of um, issues here. Obviously, um, with regard to investments, um, I haven't seen, you know, haven't uh, researched commercial property particularly, but uh, certainly what, what I have seen with regard to residential property is that some of the commentators are anticipating that there will be a fall, and you would expect that that would be the case, given the fact that um, you know property inspections and auctions. Um, are really outlawed as a result of the social distancing requirements. So there is expected to be a, uh, a dip um, as far as markets are concerned in direct and commercial property. But certainly with residential property, um, the commentators that, um, that, that I have uh, read and seen um, of recent times uh, all seem to be fairly strongly of the view that um, to the extent that the, uh, the health crisis then followed by the economic crisis is dealt with uh, effectively, which is, appears to be occurring uh, here in Australia, um, then they would anticipate that in fact property prices will continue to do following a dip that will, you know, that may last six to 12 months um, in, in, into the future. So um, for what it's worth, that's, that, that's, that's our view as far as, you know, the long-term prospects of uh, property is concerned. Um, of more direct concern, I guess, is the fact that um, you know, certainly for us, many of our clients uh, are operating businesses, um, they're, they're renting locations, there has been 
dramatic falls um, in, in their turnover um, as a result of which they have great difficulty or will have great difficulty in meeting the rental uh, payments um, that, are, that flow from um, you know that flow from their business and it raises the question from a super perspective where you are running a self-managed super fund and uh, you have an investment in commercial property which has been leased either to a third party or to a related party in what circumstances would it be acceptable um, you know for a reduction in rent to take place um, and so what we know um, one is that the ATO has uh, stated that they will not um, you know, uh, undertake compliance activity uh, with respect to self-managed super funds that do provide rent reductions uh, to related parties uh, or even unrelated parties in circumstances that are warranted as a result of the COVID-19 virus. Um, now, what, what does that actually mean? Um, does that mean that um, if I've got a um, I've got a coffee shop that is um, sitting on a, in a location which has not been really dramatically affected by the virus because in fact it happens to be on the corner of a street where people are walking regularly um, and uh, you're getting their exercise and while they're not doing sit downs they're doing lots and lots of takeaways. That, um, that we would automatically apply a reduction in rent to that business uh, just simply because everybody else has been affected by COVID-19. Now, the reality is that, uh, you know, what, what the process that in my view needs to take place is that uh, the, uh, the tenant, the landlord, and potentially the bank, if there is a loan involved, need to sit down and have a look at the um, circumstances that are surrounding uh, that particular business, and um, and if if it uh, turns out that in fact it, it does war warrants a reduction um, in rent, then that rent can actually be applied uh, for a period of time. Um, it it might be, and some of the suggestions that have been uh, made as to what be, would be commercial uh, type of arrangements would be, for example, you know, if, you know, if, you, if your client um, is a, runs a gym and, um, and gyms have been you know, required to be closed um, for the, um, you know, for, certainly for the last three weeks and um, likely for the next three months, um, then the type of arrangement that potentially might, you know, given that there is a 100% reduction in the revenue of that particular business and there is no capacity uh, to, to pay the rent um, at that particular point in time, um, then the type of arrangement potentially that might um, you know, that you might come to might be that in fact the lease is extended for a, a four month period. Um, and so there is a, effectively a lease or, or rental hold aid provided from the point of closure through to the end of the social distancing, assuming that it lasts for three months. And then as business starts to return to normal, the rent would be picked up from that particular point, but the lease would run for a further an additional four uh, months in order for the, uh, the revenue um, to be paid with regard to that before there was actually any form of uh, renegotiation. Um, and another alternative might be that, in fact, you know, there is a rent holiday provided, but an additional uh, rental amount is paid um, at, at, a, at a later point in time. But what, in that particular example of giving you, what what both the fund trustee and the tenant have gone through is they've looked at the commercial circumstances impacting. Um, impacting that particular client and have based their reductions or their holiday on the impact on that tenant's business, as opposed to, um, you know, just automatically just stopping the rent with no clear um, view as to what's actually happening uh, down the track. Um, it's it is in also interesting from, uh, from this perspective that, um, you know, certainly, that is the process that banks have stated they will adopt uh, with regard to renegotiating the loan agreements um, that individuals or businesses have with them um, with regard to commercial property or, or residential property. You know, they'll look to see how much you know, revenue has been reduced, what the capacity of the individual is to pay, 
um, et cetera, et cetera, before any arrangements are potentially entered into. Um, okay. Um, it doesn't, so these arrangements should, should not actually um, impact on the existing rights or obligations of the tenant or, or the landlord. Uh, we're not talking about changing the entire agreement, uh, but you will need to document um, these, you know, the arrangements. So there needs to be a minute uh, prepared for the uh, superannuation fund. Uh, there, there needs to be applications made by the tenant to the uh, the landlord as to the factors that need to be taken into account. Um, and obviously, um, you know, we are able to provide that type of assistance um, to to your client, to you and your clients, um, should you determine that you actually, um, you know, that this is the appropriate way for them to go. Um, now, I've also been asked the question with regard to property. Um, there's two other issues um, that need to, need to be considered here. Um, sometimes uh, commercial property, um, well, you know, so, so quite often when a fund owns commercial property, it will have a direct interest in that commercial property and it is the owner in its own right and it, it is entered into the lease agreement with the tenant. Uh, that's the circumstance that we've just outlined. In other circumstances, occasionally you'll find that a fund owns units in a unit trust. That unit trust owns um, property and a bank account and the property is leased to a related party. Um, the issues that need to be considered um, in, in this case, um, in, in order, so the issue that needs to be considered here, uh, where there is an interposed unit trust, is that um, if there is a breach of the non the arm's length provisions, uh, or the sole purpose test, or the lending to members, etc., um, then that unit trust becomes an in-house asset, and there needs to be so, um, steps taken to dispose of the fund's investment in the units um, you know, before the end of the subsequent financial year. Um, so you, property held in underlying unit trust can be a little bit difficult. However, the principle is exactly the same um, in this scenario. Um, if banks, commercial banks and tenants and landlords that are unrelated are enter into are entering into uh, effectively concessional um, rental arrangements as a result of COVID-19, um, and the arrangement that a unit trust trustee enters into with a tenant is based on the same principles, then that is a commercial arm's length arrangement, um, and once again, provided it is appropriately documented, um, it should not um, result in that trust being considered to have breached the, um, the, the arm's length rules and therefore have become an, um, an in-house asset that needs to be disposed of. So with the proper handling and, and, and the proper documentation in place, clearly considering all of the factors that need to be considered, um, it should ideally be able to dealt, be dealt with um, in a reasonable manner. Uh, and the final, um, the final one um, is with the which involves property is in circumstances where um, there is a loan in place. So the self-managed super fund, so I'm assuming it's a self-managed super fund, it's taken out a limited recourse borrowing arrangement. Um, so the fund owns the property uh, through a bare trust structure um, and has borrowed money to make that purchase. And now it is leased, the property is leased it's either leased to an arm's length tenant or it's leased to a related party. Either way, the tenant is unable to meet the rental payments with respect to the, um, the property. Um, and as a result, the fund is at risk of defaulting upon the, uh, the loan uh, that it has entered into. Now, once again, um, as I've said, banks, and certainly Anna Bly through the Australian Bankers Association has already indicated the types of arrangements potentially that they are um, uh, prepared to um, enter into um, as a result of COVID-19. 
Um, the tax officers indicated that they 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 potentially won't be um, looking to uh, take uh, corrective action or, or, or compli compliance related activity with regard to this. Um, but you need to, to um, have a clear understanding of you know why the layer arrangement was changed. You know if it was changed from in principal and interest to just interest. If it was um, if there was a repayment uh, holiday provided for six months once again. Um, does that match the types of arrangements that are actually available uh, commercially? Um, if, if it is on a commercial basis, uh, then it is highly likely that, um, that, that the income that is derived from the property will not be treated as non-arm's length income um, um, by, by the, um, by the uh, commissioner um, in those circumstances. So, but you do need to just to bear that in mind. Okay. Um, early access. Now I'm going to go through this early access, um, and uh, and it is an option that is available for people, um, and you need do need to be aware of it. And there may actually be um, circumstances where there is no alternative. Um, you know, so people will find themselves, uh, you know, w w w w with rent that has to be paid even under a restructured arrangement. Um, and yet the uh, the job keeper or the job seeker payments that they're receiving are not sufficient. Um, so th there is the ability to make withdrawals um, to up to two transactions, one uh, before the uh, the 1st of July 2020 and one before where you've applied before the 24th of September 2020. So they, they can be both made. Maximum number of applications is two one before 1 July uh, and one before 24 September uh, of amounts up to $10,000. If you think you need less money than $10,000, you really need to consider whether I actually do need the full $10,000 because if you've made an application before July and then another one in September and you've only withdrawn 14 instead of 20, you can't go back a third time and request it. Um, I, did, I did want to put one caveat in here. If you can, um, and this is simply the power of compound interest. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time in recent times talking to um, young rugby union players. So people who are 23, 24, um, all their lives in front of them um, ab about money in super. And the slide that I've actually put up in front of them was that if they took $5,000 between 25 and 35 and put it into a super fund, uh, which earned 7%, so obviously we're not talking about right now, but over the long term, 7% is not an unreasonable rate of return. So $5,000 a year for 10 years and then nothing else. Um, and they invested it for 40 years, they will end up with a million dollars. Okay. Um, and the simple reason for that is that because the money's in there early and we've got 40 years to apply compound interest to it, it will grow to a substantial amount. Interestingly, if that person does not contribute between 25 to 35, but rather waits until he is 35 and then contributes $5,000 a year for each of the next 30 years, he will end up or she will end up with nearly $1 million. But I've put three times the amount of money in as I have under the first example. And that is, that's the, 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 the so the point that I'm making is the money that is in super is generally unable to be withdrawn. We are now able to withdraw it. Should you withdraw it? My view is you should exhaust all other avenues before you actually turn to this one. Um, that is not to say that it is not always appropriate, but from a from a long-term wealth creation perspective, particularly for younger individuals, it is a very bad idea. Um, and so, that, and, to, and it is as simple as that. So, having said that, um, you know, you know. What have we got to do and how do we go about it? Well, basically the application is going to be made um, to the ATO through uh, MyGov and we need to wait for the certificate of uh, release that will be issued by the ATO. Um, without that certificate of release, it is, it is illegal early release and there are penalties including potentially having the money assessed 
Um, so it's only likely to be a trustee of a self-managed super fund that's going to release the money early. Um, so it is potentially likely, or it is possible that uh, an early release could give rise to that amount being included in a person's assessable income and taxed at top marginal um, income tax rate. So that that is to be avoided. You, people need to follow the process. Okay, so who is the, so the, first, the process is who's, who's eligible to withdraw it? So first up, um, employees on or after 1 January 2020 are made redundant or their working hours are reduced. So requiring that people take um, unpaid leave is not a reduction in their hours. Um, so it's it's a there is a reduction in their hours that's taken place here, um, and if that's of up to 20%, and if that is the case, um, then in fact you you know uh, you know you would be eligible. Um, likewise, you're a sole trader or a self-employed non-one or joint your business is suspended, so it's in hibernation, or there's a 20% reduction in turnover. Now you may need to get some help from um, our accountants uh, in order to calculate that. And that's gonna be calculated uh, compared to the average of the last six months. Um, uh, so from 1 July 19 through to uh, 31 December. Having worked out whether I'm eligible, so I've been made redundant or I've, um, I've, 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 I've had a reduction in my hours or that my turnover is reduced or my business is in hibernation. Um, I then go to MyGov um, and I submit an expression. Um, I'm able to do that from mid-April and um, the ATO is going to administer it and the, effectively there will be a certificate issued to me. Um, and so the ATO provides a release authority to the member, the member provides it to the trustee and the fund can then make a further payment. Now, um, not everybody holds their money in a self-money super fund. Um, and you know that's that's the issue. Um, so if your money's in a, an industry fund or whatever, um, then th then you'll need to make application to those trustees. Now it's been made quite clear to trustees that the only information that they need um, is a um, is that certificate from the member um, uh, saying that they are entitled to withdraw that money. They're not they they've been specifically warned not to enter into a long process of further checks and balances far, as far as people withdrawing their money is concerned. Uh, that would not be considered to be appropriate in the circumstances. Um, it is interesting in that context that I have heard of a number of auditors who are arguing that they will need to go and get extra info, etc. So we'll just have to wait and see where that settles. That's not going to be an issue that's going to arise um, before the uh, well, 19, so probably sometime in the uh, uh, 21 financial year, uh, but that, that's that's something that we do need to consider. Um, yeah, so th that's the process that's followed. Um, APRA funds, industry funds. Um, I, my apologies for these th boxes that keep appearing in my bottom right-hand corner. I have attempted to turn this thing off, but short of disconnecting from the internet, um, they just won't stop. So I'll have to talk to one of the help desk people later on to get that sorted. Um, APRA regulated funds, um, APRA regulated funds and it's basically the same process. So you apply through MyGov, you get the release authority, the fund will make the payment. Make sure the fund has the correct contact and detailed uh, people. Um, so, Couple of quick questions that hopefully will answer a few questions that people have got with regard to um, you know this particular issue. Um, what if I only apply for three thousand now and I need another three thousand in 2020? We've answered that question. It's a once only before the 30th of June and a once only before the, thir uh, the before 24 September. If I apply for ten thousand now and only need three thousand before, can I return the seven thousand to my fund? Um, the answer is yes, um, but it will be a contribution and you need to be eligible. Um, so if you're under 65 and you've, you know, you can, it's, it's concessional or non-concessional, you comply with the caps, uh, it won't be a problem. Um, so I had a, yeah, so that brings me to the end. Um, we've now got about five minutes. I'll just have a very quick question at, uh, or quick look at the, um, 
questions that have uh, come through. Uh, just bear with me. So in your example with where Sam um, has paid the minimum pension, which was recalculated either, and he ends up paying 50,000, can the difference between the minimum and the 50 be treated as a lump sum? Yeah, good question. Um, the issue, my personal view is the 24th of September is when the legislation was changed. If the payment was made before the 24th of September, then it was at that stage, it was in line with the minimum and therefore cannot be treated as a lump sum. If an additional payment, is, but if um, 9,560 9, was paid before the 24th of March, and the balance of, um, you know, the difference between 50,000 and 9,560 was paid after the 24th of March, then provided the paperwork and, uh, and we can assist, uh, well, you know, we've got drafts um, of minutes that enable excess, uh, excess payments to be uh, treated as lump sums. Um, so if you need help with that, we can provide it. Um, but yes, it is possible to treat the payment after that date um, as a lump sum withdrawal. And of course, the reason why you potentially would do that is that, uh, that the partial commutation reduces your transfer balance cap, which enables a person to actually roll in additional accumulation interests into a a retirement phase pension at a later date. Whereas if the, the pension, if the payment is fully treated as just a pension payment, there's no reduction in your transfer balance cap. There's no ability to roll a further amount in. So that's that's the um, issue there. Um, now I did, I'm just going to click out of here if I can. Um, uh, there were a number of other uh, questions which um, we received prior to, and we're almost at um, 11 o'clock, there were a number of questions that we received prior to the session. We will we'll answer all of those and um, include them with the, um, the post-seminar package um, that uh, we're, we're, we're putting together. One, one question that does, I do recall um, out of that was, can I, um, can I make a uh, contribution, deductible contribution uh, of $10,000 and then immediately um, apply to have that released as a, a, as a uh, financial hardship payment? So the advantage of that would be I get a tax deduction for $10,000 and then I then get my $10,000 back or um, $10,000 back um, without paying um, uh, any income tax on the refund. So I've got all the cash back, um, but I've saved tax at marginal tax rates and only paid tax of 15% in inside the fund. So look, and there's been a number of articles referring to that as a, uh, a loophole. Um, I certainly think that there is the prospect that the commissioner could apply part 4A to those particular arrangements. Um, you know, it's it's because they have stated before that uh, where members manipulate the uh, non-consistent contribution uh, capacity, um, you know, by making non-consistent contributions and then withdrawing them um, at a subsequent time, um, that they they could do that. Um, so I certainly think it's it's a um, you know the commission has got that particular power. I certainly think it is not in the spirit for which the concession was given. Um, and um, and people will be um, you know, certainly exposing themselves if if they were to go down that particular path. So um, I hope that helps, um, Maddie. I'm not sure whether you're there still, um, but on that basis, I think I'll bring this to a uh, this session to an end. Um, but otherwise, we will bring the session to an end. Okay, there is one more question. Here we are. So you're basically saying that if SMF is going to grant a related party entity using commercial property, make sure that you have documentation in place and look at the impact of COBAT on the rental market in the area in which the property has been located. That's exactly what I'm saying. Um, 
and uh, to mirror uh, to the extent possible the arrangements that have been put in place between arm's length parties in that particular marketplace. Um, so that information will be available. Um, certainly the banks have, have publicly stated what they're intending to do um, uh, with regard to that. Assuming, uh, so another question, assuming one legitimately meets the eligibility criteria for early release, do you think that the ATO would have an issue with the funds being recontributed shortly thereafter as a concessional contribution? I think that if the money is being um, withdrawn and then recontributed, unless you can point to a significant change in the circumstances between when the money was, was withdrawn and when the money was re, um, put back into the fund, that potentially you are exposing yourself, um, you know, to, to you know liability um, as far as the tax office is concerned. They they don't want people using these um, early access arrangements to manipulate the tax system. They are there to provide support to people who have been made redundant or have suffered a downturn within their business in order to enable them to, to um, you know, keep a roof over their head and food on their table. If that's not what you're doing, um, if your purpose in entering into a transaction is some form of tax arbitrage, then I think you can expect to be looked at fairly closely by the ATO. Um, Okay, uh, I think that might just be about it. I'm just making sure. Okay, um, that's look. That's it. I think um, I think we'll bring the session to an end. A couple of people have already left, um, but keep an eye open for the email with all of the uh, attached uh, documentation, which I'm sure you'll find very helpful. Uh, thank you very much.